So, a while ago I posted on my Facebook and Twitter that I have reached my master's promo series for the first time, and this has been the furthest I have ever gotten. Throughout the time of me making daily bronze to diamond videos, I have been climbing steadily in ranked on my main accounts. One of these accounts is cursed with a negative win rate, and I absolutely cannot win games on it. I would play on this account whenever I was feeling tilted or on a loss streak. On the other account, I would magically win, even though I was facing the exact same players on the same day and in the same place sitting. I would win simply by playing on one account and lose profusely on the other. While making the push into Masters promos, the thought crossed my mind that I would not be able to maintain it. The obvious reason is, it's a lot easier to drop out of Masters than other tiers and divisions simply by losing a couple of games at 0 LP. The other reason is because I have a holiday slash trip planned later this year. Being in Master and Challenger, the decay is brutal. So Riot requires you to play a game every day and if you fail to do so, they would deduct 100 LP each day that you're inactive. So unless I was over a 1000 LP challenger, I don't think it is possible to maintain masters when I got back. And on top of that, if you are at 99 LP masters and decay, you will instantly be dropped to Diamond 1. The system strictly takes 100 LP every day until you play a game for that day. To maintain masters and challenger, you literally have to have no life. So during my journey to Masters Promos, I had to break out of the Diamond 1 barrier. The main reason why so many people are hard stuck in High Diamond is because in order to break out of Diamond 1, you have to consistently beat full challenger teams while being the underdog. Only after consistent wins and outperforming challenger players will you be granted a chance at Master Promos. Definitely very difficult to achieve and requires a lot of luck. I'm talking about the current meta, namely bot lane. This is the lane that houses 4 players and whether the lane wins or loses will directly affect 40% of the players involved in the game, if not more depending if either junglers got involved as well. So you can quickly see that every smart high elo jungler will want to impact bot lane as number one priority if they see the opportunity to. With how strong fed ADCs are when coupled with a support, a challenger bot lane that wins lane and takes first blood tower is guaranteed a set amount of gold because in this elo, everyone's CS numbers are near perfect. Slap on an additional kill or two plus a first blood tower and you're looking at a ridiculously fed ADC and support at minimal. At worst, you would also have to deal with a fed enemy jungler who destroyed your jungler and bot lane in a 3v3 exchange, putting three of your team members behind. From a solo laner's perspective such as myself, the main difference between high elo versus low elo in the same given scenario is macro play. A fed ADC and support in challenger will press their lead into more objectives. On the other hand, most low elo bot lanes are going to take their lead and just doodle around by staying in bot lane, taking little to no further objectives past dragon and a tower. Conversely, in challenger elo, that same bot lane will snowball the game out of control regardless of what solo laners do. They will take dragon shortly after bot tower and you can expect to face a 1v2 or a 1v3 within a minute after seeing these objectives being taken. At the same time, your enemy top laner recalls and is now defending bot lane. Enemy jungler shows up and you as a top laner are now faced with a 1v3 situation. You make the smart decision by abandoning your tower and letting it fall, instead of going down with your tower in a 1v3. Even if your jungler is around, they will still forcefully siege and take top tower in a 3v2 situation. This momentum allows the enemy to get both bot and top towers, which immediately puts them even further ahead in gold and map control. They then push for a 20 minute victory shortly after hard engaging mid lane, while your side lanes are still busy playing catch up. A bunch of kills happen afterwards, your mid tower falls, they secure Baron and the game is over. So you guys get the idea, high elo most of the time is purely a bot lane coin flip. All you can do is pray your bot lane is an auto field, can CS decently and doesn't feed too much or lose their tower early. Games where bot lane goes even or slightly loses is very carryable. I'd say a good 70% of my losses was a direct result of the bot lane coin flip. But all of that aside, I found playing aggressive but smart was a key part to helping me climb into my master promos. If you are too passive, the enemy top laner will gain momentum by pushing you in, out farming and out rotating you, picking up kills, assist by roaming and inevitably outscale you. While on the other hand, going too aggressive will result in you taking bad trades and straight up losing lane. Not even dying, but just simply being zoned off from most of your farm. You can even get punished for taking a bad trade level 1 or 2. By just simply being pushed under tower with about 50 to 70% health will give the enemy jungler enough incentive to come and dive you at the 3 minute mark. This is especially common with champions like Elise and Rek'Sai. The last thing I learned is specific to Trindamir and potentially other split pushes like him. When you're uncertain on the next macro decision, the answer is always split push. Try to push the furthest lane from the next big objective. If Baron is the next contested objective, split push bot lane. 
If Baron is down and Elder Drake is the next teamfight objective, split top. The key is to split well before the objective spawns. The reason for this is you want to pressure the enemy team to split up and deal with you. If they ever send more than one person to deal with you, your team will win the 4v3 and take Baron or Dragon on the other side of the map. As a split pusher, your job is not to die while always pressuring a side lane by shoving endlessly, taking towers, Dragon, Rift Herald and enemy jungle camps. Anyways, what you're about to see is my master promos. Most of which will be done through spectate mode because I didn't want to record them live as I wanted to be fully focused while playing. So game number one into my promo series, here take a look at the op.gg for this game. 4 challenger and 1 diamond versus 4 diamonds and 1 challenger. Because this was my very first time in master promos, you can tell I was not happy to see this during pre-game loading screen. And to top it all off, in game Vlad says he knows these challenger players and they're known to always be on voice comms and they're currently in a 4 way discord call. I just want to take a moment and say, if I was Riot's matchmaking system and I was given 5 challenger players and 5 diamond players, in what world would I swap 1 challenger player for 1 diamond player and call it a day? At the time I felt if Riot had headquarters was on the minimap, I would be spamming question mark pings on them. I was literally fuming. Nonetheless, I went through with this game and here's what happened. So starting off the game, you can see that I do my regular fake leash and you can see the pings on the map right now. Jax is telling Skarno that I leash for Nunu at his own blue buff. So what Skarno does in response is he tries to mirror that, assuming that Nunu did his blue. But as you guys can see, this puts Skarno so far behind because of my fake leash. And in fact, Nunu is actually just going from blue to red. So now Skana wasted a bunch of time, and that is massive. The only thing is, Jax was auto attacking this lane the whole time, so he pushes it in, and I lose a little bit of momentum here, but I put the enemy jungler super far behind just by doing that. So as you guys can see, I'm very wary that Skana could be ganking me now. It's around the time where Skana can gank me, so this is where I was like dodging in and out, and made sure that I flashed that E, because if I didn't flash the E, that would have slowed me and that would have had to flash anyway because Skana will catch up and stun me. So either way, that flash was gone regardless. And if I stayed and took all that damage, then I won't be able to push this in. So now I'm healthy, I can push this in, massive minion wave, mission accomplished. But at the same time, I'm still worried that Skana could come back. So that's why I'm like edging back and forth in the river. I see my next minion wave comes, so I know that this is safe. I have more health than this Jax. I also run Ignite this game. So I know that with this minion wave backing me up, even if Skana comes back, I am fine. So this is where I stand my ground. I have such a big advantage in terms of health that I can fight this. As you guys can see, Skana comes back. I just W spin auto with Ignite and he's dead. After that, I can also fight Skana in my minion wave because I'm auto attacking and backing into my minion wave. So if he fights me, he will lose since I still have a big Q heal. And I'm also full fury, so I have a lot of crit. So at this point, I can see that this wave is pushing into me, I just go back. At the same time, because I ruined this gank for them, and also ruined Skarner at the same time with my fake leash, Nunu gets a free dragon here, because everyone knows on the map where Skarner is. So I go back with a nice gold lead and get a tier mark right away on my first back. So due to my item advantage and level advantage, I can just start fighting Jax in his own minion wave, because tier mark's so strong in fighting in enemy minion waves, you can just clear it while killing the enemy laner. So this is what happens. Jax gets chunked really low, and he's ready to be dove on. So we'll push this in, we get ready for a dive, but unfortunately because it's a Nunu, he does little to no damage, he does negative damage, he just has Blood Boil and E. So we see that he pops Counter-Strike, I back away so that I can come back in, but then later on, due to Fog of War, we also see Skarno being scouted out by this ward, so we decide to just back away completely. If you're getting a Nunu gank, just make sure that you're doing all the damage and Nunu's just there to be a meat shield and just a tank for you. So unless you can definitely kill Jax by yourself with your own damage, it's just not going to work. So we just start destroying this Jax over and over. And at this point, he has to leave his tower. Push this in. And we do a pretty serious number onto this tower. It's already at half. As you guys can see, I'm very careful here, so I buy two daggers and a cloth armor. This is just so that even if I do get ganked, I can 2v1 very easily with this cloth armor. It's very guaranteed. If you buy boots, it's a little bit greedy. And plus, you don't really need to chase them down. The thing is, this Jax, if he's going to die to me, he's going to die under his own tower anyway, so boots is not very necessary. And I can easily fight him whenever I want, so I always want to pop his bone plating with my Tima, and then I want to trade with him. Make him pop his Counter-Strike, and then I can come back in. So he pops his Counter-Strike, and this is my go to fight him. Because I have Ignite up, I have everything up, and I also have a lot of pressure to the point where Nunu can can take the enemy blue buff as well. So that was a very easy kill right there. Nunu steals a blue, and Skarner is nowhere to be seen yet. And I just simply push this in. 
This time I know that Jax's teleport is down, so this is a very easy first blood tower at 9 minutes. This is something you can do in very high elo. And it's all about calculated smart aggression. You can't just simply be aggressive all the time. You have to be very, very smart about it and know your limits. Know exactly if you can be aggressive or not. And there you go, 650 gold. That's an insane amount of gold and a very huge lead. And this is in challenger elo. By the way, if you see a Zed on the enemy team, you're most likely to win. I'm just going to say that right now. If, if you made it to high elo and you see a Zed on the enemy team, it's pretty much a free win. It's just same for Yasuo on the enemy team and Talon on the enemy team. If you see that, and you see a AD top laner like Jax, you see an AD jungler, you pretty much won the game. That's how I feel when I play Trinomir. At this point, Nunu's quite ahead as well because he's just been counter jungling and having his way with all that top pressure. Support flashes in, gets a really nice ult, and bot lane gets a double kill. So this game is pretty much over. 100%, this, this game's over. Because I got so much gold for my team with this first blood tower. And I also screwed up this jungler with a fake leash. I also killed him while the enemy jungler was wasting time ganking me and getting nothing out of it. So at this point, I just capture the Spire and go and take Rift Herald. At the same time of taking Rift Herald, we see that our jungler is taking Dragon. So we have so much map control because of how bot lanes opened up, top lanes opened up. And now all we have to do is take mid lane. So the smart thing to do is to use Rift Herald at mid. So as you guys can see, I use Rift Herald at mid. They manage to kill off a few people, take mid tower, and then we just use it for tier 2. Very clean. Everything we do is very clean, very calculated, and just very precise. And this is exactly what you have to do in order to climb and win in high elo as well. And if you use this strategy in low elo, you're going to close out games really fast. So it doesn't matter what elo, you just use this strategy, you'll close out games really fast, very efficiently. But it's all about laning phase and playing very smart, very calculated and aggressive. But you have to be aggressive, you can't be passive. If you're passive, then you're playing like an auto field player. And auto field players do not do really well. They might not die much, they might be very safe, and they might have that 50% win chance because they're just playing a tank and being very safe and not doing much at all in terms of carrying. Then yes, you can have a 50% win rate by playing very passive. As you guys can see at this point, we're just working down each outer tower, whichever's the next easiest objective, we just work down one at a time to the point where we get all the inhibs and then we just close out the game like textbook. That's literally what you have to do. And then the enemy team at the same time, if you're taking so many objectives outside and they can't do anything about it, they just seem to give up, you know? They just don't play well, they stay in base. I get pulled into Fountain, but I'm a Trindomir, so it doesn't even matter. But actually it does matter, just, just for the record guys, you do take true damage from this, from Fountain, so your ult won't save you. So yeah, after that, work down all the objectives and just close out the game very clean, very easy, very fast. And then we'll go on to game two. Okay, so game one wasn't too bad. Full team of challengers versus full team of diamonds, no problem. But this next one, take a look at what Riot threw at me this time. A Platinum 1 ADC with a 38% win rate. How did this happen? I have no idea. But I'm definitely sending Riot more question mark pings. At this point, we know that Riot's matchmaking is completely against me, but let's watch what happens anyway. So starting off game number two, you guys can see that I do my signature fake leash again. But this time it's a little bit different. I fake leash from blue. And the reason being is because Warwick just did red. So that is the reason for it, is just to confuse the crap out of them. And it makes Kha'Zix think that he's starting blue, but it's actually, he just goes to his red and he gets nothing out of it again. The mind games, guys, it's really strong. Also, I just want to show you guys the early trade because you clear out the first three melee minions, and then now Conqueror stacked up, you just go, just go straight to town on her. It's like that, look at that health. At the same time, we can see that Kha'Zix goes straight to red, gets nothing out of it, and is falling behind already. At the same time, Warwick is getting his third camp, and Kha'Zix is just looking for a third camp, but he can't find one. Oh, also, of course, we can't forget about this plat 1 ADC. Let's just see what happens. So she eats two skill shots to the face, flashes away, heals, and then dies. But that's purely because she knows that as an ADC, you should know level 1 and level 2 power spikes. 9 minions is level 2 power spike, you can't do that. A mistake that happens only in low elo. You're going to have people that feed if they're playing in challenger elo, it just doesn't work. Karthus is going to go for a hero play. Oh my. 
But yeah, I was always wondering what happened to bot lane because they got absolutely demolished. It's not a secret, guys. It's a plat 1 ADC. That person's going to feed profusely. I'm not saying it's that player's fault. I feel like it's Riot's fault, but I was really frustrated that Riot would send a plat 1 ADC with a 38% win rate into a challenger or high diamond game. It just doesn't make any sense. Okay, so later down the track, I still have a river ward and I see Kha'Zix coming in. And this is a very easy escape. Once Kha'Zix jumps on you, you just jump away. But you don't use your E unless he uses his E. And if he just straight up walks up to you and, you know, orders you, then you pretty much ran away a bit too late. So that's the only thing is you have to notice early enough so that he's forced to use his gap closer to go on you and then you can gap close away or at least dash away. At the same time, because I survived this gank very easily and these two can't tail dive me, Warwick gets a free Infernal Drake. Absolutely massive here. So I knew that I could easily survive both of them. I just stay under tower. It's up to your own experience. If you know you can survive, you stay. If you know you can't survive, you run. That's the, literally, there's no in-betweens. If you stay, it means you know you can survive. So we get Infernal Drake really nice, but still we're 0-2, so we have to make some really hard carry plays. And I knew going into this game that I was with a plat 1 ADC, and I knew I had to hard carry this game. But at the same time, I just had to pray that my ADC didn't feed. Yeah, okay, so she just walks up, overextends by herself and dies again, gets zoned off. At the same time, I have a Warwick gank here, so very nice. Just simply W, spin onto her, ignite, and that's it. She's dead. Ilau is very easy to gank, and she has a lot of trouble killing you. Ilaoi can't kill you unless you let her. You have to all in her and miscalculate, and then she can kill you. Otherwise, there's no way she can kill you. Oh, also, if you stand still and let the E tentacle slam hit you, then you might die as well. So this is the part in the game where everything went super south. As you guys can see, Vlad comes in. Kha'Zix is nearby, and they literally are zoned off from their own tower. It's because of how there's so little momentum and little pressure that bot lane is putting out. They're not aggressive enough, they're just playing so passive, and this is just what happens. You just get punished so hard. So if I was playing a bit too passive and not aggressive enough in lane, this is what would happen to me, I would just get dope. You have to have a mix of aggression and passiveness and play really smart, and this all just comes down from experience. That's why if you're off roll, it'll never work no matter what because you just don't have the experience, you just don't know what's going to happen, you don't know how to play it out. It's just all about watching high elo players and learning from them, when to be aggressive, when to be passive. So because bot lane won, very convincingly, this game is going to be a lot harder than it should be. But the main problem I had isn't because my bot lane lost, it's because of her CS. Her CS is 35 at 10 minutes, and that is unacceptable in high diamond. Because no matter how badly you lose, you should have more than 37 CS, at almost 11 minutes. So when I saw the CS number, I knew that Jinx is going to be useless for the rest of the game. So here Jinx goes into the bush and tries to clear a pink ward. I'm all, I wonder what would happen, right? I think the smart thing, at the very least, is you should ward this bush and then attack from outside the bush. That was probably the safest way to clear a pink ward anyway. So yeah, bot lane dies again, both of them dead. And at this point, I'm nearly working down top tower. It's 11 minutes in, like I'm almost there. I can literally dive this Ilaoi, but nonetheless, I see Vlad over here, and I also see my teammates coming in, so I knew that I can just all in here, and it shouldn't matter. It's right around here, just auto and spin, spin and auto, or just one auto. But yeah, the most important thing is we want to work down this tower. So three of us here, looks like we choose to recall. I think at this point I was thinking, my health is way too low, if I go near this Kha'Zix, he'll just auto and Q me, I'm dead. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to escort Zoe out properly, I guess? Or at least she dies here, I had to just abandon ship. This is what happens when bot lane has the momentum, is they rotate to top lane first. And then they are going to take this tower, because they already took bot tower. And our bot lane is just busy trying to play catch up, so... What's our bot lane going to do? Eventually come here. But they already have the momentum, they're taking another tower here. So at this point we go for a Desperation Dragon, which gets stolen by Ilaoi, and Jinx does negative damage, so even this underfed Ilaoi survives. I'm pretty sure as an ADC you need to get AD items first, say a BF Sword or something like that, or even Culling if you're super far behind you get Cull, and you get a Pickaxe, and then after that you can get Zerka Greaves. So I just take this in front of Ezreal's face, but he decides to stand still and fight, so I just straight up tower dive him. Didn't even need to ult there. Take this tower. I just remember that at this point, 
I saw Jinx's CS, I knew this game was over unless I took a lot of risks. So here I see that I wasn't able to get this tower because Kha'Zix came, had to ult there and get out. At this point I was 3-0, 120 CS at 14 minutes, but Jinx is 44 CS, which is very worrying. So at this point our team isn't doing so hot. Zoe dies here. Karthus is dead as well. Uh, I pick up a kill on Ezreal. And yeah, I couldn't get any more out of it. They just teleported on here. I couldn't 3v1. Also, my team wasn't coming to back me up either. Or I would have went in because I had ult. At this point, our team is super far behind and they're looking to fight them. I'm not sure why Karthus walked up and decided they want to engage. So Karthus dies here, absolutely suicided there. And then rest of the team just gets cleaned up. I was down here 1v1ing Illaoi. And I couldn't see an opportunity to come in and flank as well. By the time I got there, my whole team died, only Zoe's alive. So now we have a 2 and 12 bot lane and we did eventually work down this top tower. So after my team dies off and they respawn, Enemy team does Baron, and there's not much we can really do about it. So Zoe split pushing top. After clearing out the wave, she recalls on the spot. Gets caught out by Kha'Zix and dies instantly. And then we have three pushing mid with Baron buff. As Trindamir, if you see someone sieging tower like this, most of the time if you could go to a side lane and kill someone, that's actually the right thing to do, unless they go for a team fight here. And we ended with a defeat, even though it says victory, but because it's spectate. So on to game number 3, this video has been going on for just a little bit too long so I'm going to speed things up a little bit and just tell you guys roughly what happened. Basically Rek'Sai was just camping the crap out of me and I had a really bad game. I lost a ton of momentum in lane as you guys can see in the game time on the top of the screen, you guys will see how long Rek'Sai camps me for. A very very long time. And he even stays until that ward dies and he realizes oh it's been warded the whole time. Later on Camille goes for a little bit of a tower dive and then she shoves me in and starts to roam. At this point in the game, they go for a 5-man tower dive onto Karthus, which I thought was pretty funny. Karthus keeps doing damage after he dies, so this isn't going to look really good for the enemy team. And as you guys can see, Karthus picks up a triple kill quite easily without any issues. Later down the track, we have Rek'Sai coming in back for a repeat gank. Unfortunately for Camille, her ultimate was not up and they weren't able to lock me down and trap me for a successful kill. But later on, I found an opportunity to fight Camille. It was supposed to be a 1v1, but Rexa comes back in again, and this time... He actually gets the kill on me. A few minutes later, after split pushing for a little bit, I go for a jungle camp, and I got caught out with my ultimate up. But unfortunately, Camille's ultimate locked me down, I wasn't able to survive. Fortunately for me, my team comes in and cleans up the fight. Kaisa and Karthus carried this game pretty hard. She even flashes in and picks up a bunch of kills, along with Karthus. The best course of action for me was to split bot lane and catch up recoup my losses because I was really far behind at this point and I just needed to get a kill on Rek'Sai who perfectly times the ultimate once again. Later on when I respawn I come down to bot lane and they send another two people after me but this time it's the 20 minute mark and Baron has already spawned. I tried to fight back, tried to get a kill with Ignite but it didn't work, doesn't really matter, my team goes and tries to take Baron. Look at how this Kai'Sa plays, it's really important how Kai'Sa keeps auto attacking this Baron instead of doing nothing and walking around back and forth like most ADCs do. That way we could actually finish off Baron, have enough damage to take Baron and turn around, win the fight.
This Kai'Sa played really well, and if Jace had rotated with Rek'Sai, this fight would have gone very differently, but instead, we end up cleaning up house, and this game is pretty much over. Due to the amount of pressure and lead that my team exerted, I was able to push down bot, my team pushed down mid, were able to just collapse on the enemy, finish off Jace, and end off the game. So heading into game number 4 so far, we have 2 wins and 1 loss. If we do win, we jump straight into Masters, but if we lose, we have 1 more chance. If I showed you my flaws, if I couldn't be strong, tell me honestly, would you still love me the same? So in game number 4, we had a pretty awkward start where this red buff just bugged out and reset on us. It didn't make any sense whatsoever. We also had a Yorick jungle, so it means we had 2 split pushes in this game. It really depended on how we played mid to late game. If we were to all team fight, then we'll automatically lose. And if we were to split push, then we'll win. So that's exactly what we had in mind from the very start of the game is we recognized two split pushes and we knew that it was a 1-3-1 game right away off the bat. Cho'Gath honestly is a resident sleeper lane and if you try to fight him early, you're going to lose all the trades and it's going to heal up from pushing you in. So at 8 minute mark, I was able to kill him. So it was really nice. Got a good dive off. And then later on, I tried to work down this tower. Yorick tried to go for a Rift Herald, an early Rift Herald, and he just got caught out and just dies. So that was really rough. And as you guys can see in chat, Lulu was getting really toxic, starting to spam ping Yorick. And it just got to a point where I had to just mute right away, and just keep playing. That's the best thing you can do if a situation like that happens in a game that you really care about. We see Lee trying to fight us, and I saw our ultimate up, so I easily just went and killed Lee. Chill out. Try to get out and actually do so because Cho'Gath accidentally ults a bit too early. I thought about recalling but I decided not to because I saw Cho'Gath was completely out of mana. I had about 400 health, I could just spin into the minion wave, instant tier mark clear it and then I thought I'd be fine. But Cho'Gath's auto attacks actually do 200 damage per hit and I was able to get two shotted by him so that really sucked. Later on, Cho'Gath makes a TP play at bot, and that gives me the perfect opportunity to not only get the first blood tower, but also work down the second tower by a lot. Right here, Yorick picks the wrong fight yet again, and he ends up getting kicked by Lee back into the team and ends up dying. Seeing as Cho'Gath is doodling at bot lane doing absolutely nothing, I took this opportunity to go and finish off top tower and rotating into the jungle, maybe taking a blue buff, seeing what I could do, just pushing top lane out and rotating to mid potentially. But then I see Ryze over here completely out of mana, he's soloing blue, so I thought this is a perfect opportunity for me to kill him because I have all my sums up, I have flash, I have ult, everything up, so the perfect opportunity to go for a kill, so I went for it. Successfully, we land a kill and now I just rotate to mid, take that mid tower back away, perfect. Now that the top and mid towers are all taken care of, I went down to bot and tried to finish off the bot tower. Unfortunately, I got ported on by Ryze and it was a very close call to getting caught by Ryze's snare. I literally got away just by the tiniest bit. After that, I return back to bot lane. Once Ryze is gone, I take this tower right in Cho'Gath's face. Here I see Malzahar getting caught and there's absolutely nothing I could do to save him. I wanted to sneak this Infernal Drake but unfortunately Yorick was dragging them over here so I wasn't able to sneak that. We end up trying to help him out just to bail him out and see if he could survive which he does but then unfortunately I get hit by a Thresh Hook and I had to ult pretty much right away. All I had to do is just get a few more crits off and then I can just spin out with my E, blast cone away and I am completely fine. A minute later I return to bot lane to try and split push and then I end up encountering Lucian. So what I end up doing is I pushed it in, I snuck back into the jungle and then once he recalled I went back in and tried to push this tower down. Unfortunately Lee comes down to stop me and I end up juking his Q. I see Malzahar at the corner of my eye and I knew that I could just go back in, kin W, ignite and just finish him off. After sieging for a little bit at bot lane and my ult was already down, I end up recalling and coming back, but unfortunately Malzahar stayed back and he gets collapsed on. Tries to teleport out, fresh hooks him and just didn't work out, so I was like, oh wow, he overstayed pretty hard there. At this point I recognized that they were already on Baron and my jungler decided to recall, so he was in base nowhere near to contest. So I straight up tanked this tower, took it out, after that Yorick goes and gets caught out again unfortunately. We just had to keep pressuring bot lane and force someone to come. Lulu was really tilted or something like that, I did mute her and she just decided to group with me which really didn't help out since there was absolutely nothing we could do against a Cho'Gath as the two of us. He was just too tanky at the moment. And also they were sieging in mid and Lulu should have been there defending. I was just trying to work down Cho'Gath, work down the tower, none of which really worked out. 
eventually we get collapsed on because there's two people with us at bot lane so it's a lot easier for the enemy to decide to collapse on us. I use my TMR splash to stop Thresher's Moby boots which I'm really used to seeing. In this game he didn't have it, he had lucidity instead. Our team was completely out of position and disorganized even though it was a 5v4 we weren't able to get an infernal drake off of them. At this point I thought I was strong enough to 1v1 the Cho'Gath but my biggest mistake here was I didn't stack up my Conqueror before going in on him. No way, I altered. Since it takes a very long time to stack up Conqueror, I just didn't have enough damage and also I missed my ultimate. I honestly did press R but maybe it just didn't register or I was too slow with it, I do not know. Later in the game we found that Cho'Gath is completely out of position, this was a very free catch, unfortunately gets bailed out by Thresh, Lucian just simply dashes in and... Malzahar gets caught out, just that simple, very easy for him to get caught out. He dies and now we have to stop them from doing Baron. I end up going for Lucian, he flashes away and I just decide to E down but unfortunately even with 400 health, Cho'Gath just one shots me with one auto attack so that was really surprising and very shocking how much damage he does, really insane. After that Ezreal goes 1 for 1 with Lucian and they get a Baron. After a respawn I push out top and try to steal a blue buff, unfortunately Ryze stops me and takes it off me. After that I see a fight happening at bot lane, I decide to push in top as fast as I can and try to do as much damage as I can to the tower while tanking it before someone shows up. Because of the fact that Lucian was extremely fed, I had to ult really early and I thought maybe I could just turn on him and just kill him but unfortunately Thresh shows up, plays me, everything just goes downhill there. Wasn't able to get a kill but luckily on the other side of the map we do get a rise kill. They then siege mid and end up taking an inhib while Yorick goes and split pushes bot. Unfortunately after I respawn, Yorick gets collapsed on and dies. I take red buff, push in top, I see Ryze at top so I decide to rotate back to bot lane. After that we see Malzahar get a really nice ultimate onto Lee so I end up just going up there and finishing him off with ignite and autos just to make sure that he dies to ignite. A team fight breaks out, I spin over the wall and get a very nice catch on Lucian, then we just finish off and chase down not only Cho'Gath but also eventually Thresh. Just hearing the sound of Ace, I immediately went to bot and just backdoored that tower because I know it was really low, so I end up getting bot tower and also the inhib, taking red buff, and this is the game winning play right here. Ezreal calls for assist onto that bush, and we know that Elder Drake is about to spawn, so we know that Lucian's also coming since we spotted him with a ward, he face checks and we end up just instantly killing him. After that, Cho'Gath is out of position as well because Lucian's not nearby, so we end up getting a very nice, easy and clean kill on Cho'Gath. I altered at 1500 health and didn't take any risk at all. After that we take not only Elder Drake, but we also head straight to Baron and take that out while Malzahar is taking top tower. After taking Elder Dragon and Baron, the next objective is to take mid tower, but in order to do that I wanted to shove in the side lanes to make sure that the enemy will immediately respond to me. And that gives my team the opportunity to take the tower while splitting the enemy up because they're forced to respond to me to stop me from ending the game from bot lane. Because the enemy decide to fall back to their nexus tower, we end up getting every single outer inhibitor and rotating to Cho'Gath, who was still fighting Yorick this entire time, finished him off, and then we just pushed in to the nexus for the final victory push. Yes! Oh my god. Oh my god, oh my god. Be honest. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video, remember to show some support to this channel with a like and a subscribe helps out a lot. Trying out a bunch of commentary styles, so let me know which game you guys enjoyed the most, whether it's commentary for game number one, two, three, or four. Let me know. This will help me a bunch in improving my content for the future. Anyways, thank you so much for watching to the very end, and I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.